Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Now, before I start, I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to close your eyes, close your eyes, and I want you to imagine the internet. Right, what do you see? Do you see Facebook? Online shopping? Sasha Gray? Twitter? LinkedIn? Right, that's what you see. There's one thing you don't see anymore, and that is cables, computers, electricity supply. You basically totally forgot about this massive infrastructure underlying the internet today. And that's great. The internet has gone, undergone a great transformation from a, you know, kind of a technology-driven artifact to a business and opportunity-driven one. And that's not the only internet which is undergoing that transformation. We build another one for you. We build a mobile internet for you, right? So your mobile phones, they connect to the internet today almost seamlessly, so you forget about whether I have coverage or no coverage. It's just there when you need it. And there's another internet we're currently designing, which is very, very exciting, really, which is the things internet. So the internet of things. Imagine a world where all the objects, sensors, actuators are actually connected in real time. It's a world where, you know, a cow in New Zealand farts, and you will know because we will have smartphone applications which tell us that thing, and people interested in that, or oh, my belly growing by another 10%, and you will probably know before I do. So you get the idea. It's essentially a totally instrumented world. Now, these internets which we have designed for you, so the fixed internet, uh, the mobile internet and the things internet, they have one thing in common. They're able to transmit information, right? So it's video, audio, or some other type of information going from point A to point B. But there's one thing these internets can't do, and that is to transmit touch. What we're doing right now here at King's College London and with our colleagues globally, we are pioneering a totally new internet which would allow us to transmit touch in real time to any point on this planet. Once we have it up and running, what can we do? So I could use my fingers to teach a child in Africa how to play the piano. We could have our Vauxhall engineers use their skill to essentially service a carnasia. We could have our King's College doctors perform health checks or even surgery in Sierra Leone. That's what we could do. That would be brilliant, isn't it? Let's give a name to this internet. And uh, I want to share a personal story here. About two years ago, I met a, a billionaire called Anthony Salim. And he had a very big problem, very, very big problem. Uh, he and his buddies, and I'm sure some of you may have it, he didn't know how to service his fleet of private jets, OK? So the choice was either do it in Dallas, so he had to fly them over to the United States, or build a whole new facility in Asia. Now, that was dramatic. And you know, he, he said to Misha, do you have an idea how we can get about that? And you know, in my routine talking to billionaires, I had an idea, and this is when it clicked when I say, hey, why don't we combine robotics, artificial intelligence, and communications and networking to do exactly what Salim needed? I called it back then closing the data cycle, okay, from sensing, processing, and actuation. A really ugly engineering name, um, which was good enough for the N National Science Foundation in the United States to take it up into their program. But fortunately, a good friend of mine and a mentor of mine came along, uh, Professor Gerd Fettweiss from Dresden University, and with his colleagues, he termed a fantastic uh, term, which is the tactile internet. It's exactly what we want to do, transmit touch through the internet. I love that term because it's a beautiful continuation from our fixed internet, mobile internet, things internet, and now we have the touch, the tactile internet, okay? It's a, it's a massive transformation from an information delivery network to a um, skill set, labor delivery network, okay? So the only thing we need to do now is just, just to build it. It's uh, basically all an easy ride, to be honest with you, except for one minor detail, we need to break the laws of physics. Now, 
Let's go step by step. Imagine I want to touch the face of a beloved one on the other side of the planet. What do we need? We need a robotic edge. We need a tactile sensor on the other side, which takes that information. On my end, I need a haptic actuator, which reproduces that feeling. Both of these areas are well explored. We have different ways of doing that, either real robotics or stimulating currents. There's a lot of things we can do. But this is not what the tactile internet is about. The tactile internet, the real challenge here is you need to do things very, very quick. And those who are gamers in this crowd or those who sat in a flight simulator, they know that if the delay between action and reaction is more than a millisecond, you get cyber sick, okay? And we don't want that. So we have to make sure that the signals travels forth and back within a millisecond. Now, the best we can do on this planet is speed of light. Speed of light, one millisecond, how much does it buy? 150 kilometers to go, 150 kilometers to come back. That's nothing. How can I have my, my best doctors in, in, in Los Angeles do an operation in, in Sierra Leone? It's impossible. Speed of light is so slow, okay? What do we do about it? Well, people started working on this really brute force. That's what they do, trying to make the network quicker, not realizing, hey, you know, there's always that fundamental limit. So we started at King's together with, uh, with Ericsson, a telecom giant, to get along that problem. So we started essentially to see it from a different angle. We said, hey, what do we need really to make that happen? First thing we realized is we need a tactile codec. The same way as we have a video codec, a sound codec, a, an MP3 player type of stuff. That, we don't have it. So we need to build that. That allows us to mesh up different sensing streams. We can have different people controlling things. We're currently developing that together with the Center for Robotics. The other thing we do with, our, with my Center for Telecom Research, we make the network more resilient. Because the last thing you want to happen is while somebody is doing a remote eye surgery on you, you get a dropped call like you get in London, right? Suddenly the thing doesn't work anymore. You don't want that, so we're working on this. But the holy grail, and that's what we do with our best guys in artificial intelligence, is essentially beating this limit on the speed of light. So how do we do that? It turns out that skill and what we do is very, very repetitive. Also because our degrees of freedoms on doing things is not too large. So what about having two predictive engines running on the other side of the planet and on my end, basically predicting what I'm about to do and actuating on this in almost real time. And I'm only transmitting an update of these type of artificial intelligence coefficients when there's a change in my actuation, for which I have so much more time. 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, which gives me exactly the time to beat the speed of light to go to the other side of the planet, right? So that's what we're doing right now. Now, I'm... Uh, hands-on guy having worked for a year in construction, and uh, when I do things, I like to do a reality check. A reality check whether people actually need what we are designing, whether they want it. So I went out to the streets of London and I interviewed people. So here you go. I'm exactly sure what I'd use it for. I mean, I write a feed blog, so there could be some possibilities about touching the feed, but um, not quite sure how that could work. It's amazing. I think if we could do that, it'd be like really like incredible. And then um, you could use it for anything. You could use it to like save people's lives. Like it could be like the next big thing. It could be like really life changing. Cool. Like amazing. It, the kind of working with my hands is very important, and also encouraging other people to kind of work with their hands, my work is quite participatory and I use things like clay and concrete from building sites so that sort of tactile nature to, um, to the work that I make is quite interesting so the ideas you've just kind of uh, suggested to me I, I'd be really interested to see how that kind of develops because although it's kind of less tactile but it's still kind of uh, you know how you could sort of um, use your hands across the other side of the world like that is, is quite an interesting thing to think about. 
Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think the restrictions on internet at the moment are that you can literally share visual and audio content, but it's really difficult as a design person to actually get your you know, hand aesthetic across um, via the internet if it's not something visual uh, or audible. Um, I think Krista and I, currently, if we're trying to work on a sculpture together and I'm in a different country or Chris is in a different country or even just a different place in, in the city, um, we'll send pictures and we'll be like, does this look right? Is this one right? And we'll have to do the sculpture many times. Whereas mm -hmm. if we could actually, physically, have, yeah, yeah, physically do it through the internet, do yeah. it through the internet. So we, you know, I could control Chris's hands, or even just what you could, I don't know, like do different stuff. I could be like, not like this, more like this, mm -hmm. um, for starters. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess, yeah, if, if we were sort of branching out into other unseen territories, if we were on a different planet, mm -hmm. <laughs> we could start to. I don't know, manipulate the, to create something in a different world that perhaps the human couldn't go to, mm -hmm. I guess. Well said. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea. In my industry, I work finance-wise, but the industry actually I work in, media um, and TV post-production, I think it'd be absolutely fantastic. I really think it'd be beneficial for them. Yeah. So, as a creator of video series Digital Futures, which focuses on tech for good, I tend to keep a really close eye on advances that have the capacity to impact our day-to-day -day lives. The tactile internet for me is certainly one of them. If we can see and hear things that aren't close by, why shouldn't we be able to feel them, right? To be able to use data networks to relay actual human touch would be surreal and it's attainable. To me, I think the biggest reason to get excited about this is the potential for health and education. Then you've got the marrying of the two worlds of AI and the tactile internet. You could remotely control humanoid robots who would be performing surgery or other public services. It's the immersive nature of something like this that really lights my fire. Well, I would play some games and I would... I might want to play in there instead of up there. And it will be so nice when you touch your dad when he's traveling and then you can go through the computer and say hello and keep a while with him and then you can kiss him, you can kiss him and you can kiss him. So ladies and gentlemen, Beside all the creativity of the adults in the video, it uh, took again a child six years old to figure out that the tactile internet in 2030 will be used to bring love and peace to this planet. Thank you very much.